So the first question is, I want to talk about the title of this. Um, the title of this is called, You Can Be a Hero, How Your Food Choices Impact Climate Change, Natural Resource Depletion, Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, Treatment of Animals, Extinction of Nature, Water Shortages in the Environment. Did I... Did we get carried away and exaggerate just for marketing purposes? I mean, it seems a little, like, outrageous that I'm saying here that your food, what you're going to eat for lunch or dinner, would have a real effect. So was this just marketing to get people to come to your panel, or are we being serious that your food choices are really making a difference in some of these incredibly important health and environmental issues? Well, I suppose you know your marketing intentions better than I do, but uh, if you were just trying to market, you got lucky <laughs> because that's all true. What we eat has an enormous impact. It sends out ripples that impact our own health, that impact our economy, that impact our environment, that impact animals, that impact people and ecosystems all over the world. What you eat is super personal. It literally becomes you. Um, but it's also very political. It impacts farm workers. It impacts animals and families and whether or not people have the means to feed their own families. Whether it's the chocolate industry, which, you know, um, over half the world's chocolate comes from the Ivory Coast and Ghana, West Africa, where children are enslaved, where the average farmer growing chocolate is paid a dollar a day. And um, when we participate by buying chocolate from Nestle and Mars and Hershey's and the other big chocolate companies from West Africa, we're actually supporting an industry that is profiting at the expense of some of the poorest people on the planet. Or whether it's the factory farming industry, which has re epidemic rates of PTSD. People who are in these industries don't take these jobs because they like bashing in the brains of animals all day long. They take them because they're trying to survive. But essentially, we have the blood on our hands, too, when we, as a consumer, purchase these products, uh, whether it's farm workers who are dying in the fields of pesticide exposure. So I like to illumine the reality that our food choices have these huge impacts because I believe that deep down almost everybody cares and wants to be a part of something positive on this planet. Nobody likes to feel like their hands are on the chainsaw that's cutting down the rainforest. And when we realize what's really at stake, we realize how powerful we are, that every bite we take is a vote for a healthier world. So yes, I think it is that big and bigger than you're saying in the title. And um, there's actually, I think, no way to um, understate uh, the devastating impact of animal agriculture on our planet, uh, on our society, on our physical health, on our, as I said today, our psychological health, our spiritual and ethical health. And um, this, I'm so grateful really to you, Steve, for uh, working so hard to create a context for us to address these issues because the mass media is not gonna address these issues because the, uh, the advertisers, uh, the big pharmaceutical industries and chemical industries and the fast food industries and the petroleum industries and the weapons manufacturers and so forth, uh, the underlying profits that, and the banking industry, of course, in the background, really are dependent on us not questioning animal agriculture. Uh, the important thing, I think, to understand is that we have animal agriculture uh, being really the most powerfully destructive activity that human beings engage in uh, in terms of what we're doing to rainforests and oceans and all the things that you mentioned, Steve, the uh, overfishing of the oceans, the destruction of rainforests, and the uh, complete uh, destruction of, of aquifers and soil uh, and so forth. And beyond that, uh, as Ocean mentioned, the, the workers who are so harmed uh, and our own physical health and diabetes and osteoporosis and liver disease and kidney disease and cancer and diabetes, all these are directly related to diets high in animal-based foods, which we understand now more and more clearly. But what I want to emphasize continually is what animal agriculture does to the inner landscape of our consciousness. I think this is something that's really important to understand that 
if I'm taking out my wallet and paying for people to abuse animals and for the destruction that's happening to ecosystems, uh, there's an underlying uh, yearning to not understand that, to, to disconnect from that. And this mentality of disconnectedness, of just basically pretending that I can commit acts of violence towards other beings and that it has no repercussions. This is the big problem and it reduces our intelligence as a society to a massive degree. And I think it explains why we can have so many apparently intelligent people working in ways to destroy our, our life together. While we have science and technology that are churning out more and more toxic chemicals, uh, more powerful weapons, more systems of mass enslavement of humanity in various ways. And it's really incumbent on us, I think, to awaken the sacred feminine dimension of consciousness within ourselves that yearns to care for life, that yearns to protect the interconnected web of life, and that uh, understands that we're all interconnected, that all living beings are interconnected, that our welfare is interconnected. And as soon as I take out my wallet and pay for someone to stab animals or impregnate them against their will on rape racks and steal their babies and kill their babies and then actually eat that stuff and feed it to my children. What it's doing is it's just, it's just creating a momentum of violence that keeps building and as it builds and builds, we get greater uh, violent manifestations of this violence in terms of weapons and diseases and uh, inequality and injustice because the underlying message of animal agriculture is one of privilege and elitism, that certain beings are superior, that's us, and other beings are inferior, and uh, it's totally fine for the superior beings to dominate and exploit the, in, uh, the, the, the superior beings to dominate and exploit the inferior beings. And so I think when we look deeply, we see that animal agriculture is the most devastating activity to the outer world of our environment and our society and our physical health, but even more importantly, what it really does that's so damaging is that it, it reduces our capacities to deal effectively with these problems. It reduces our intelligence, our, our emotional and cognitive awareness and ability to make connections. And so really what we're seeing, and I'm so glad, is we're seeing a tremendous momentum building of people questioning the food system and questioning the violence uh, that we're committing towards animals and future generations and hungry people and slaughterhouse workers and, um, and, and wildlife on, on every level, and our own, our own organs. Uh, and as we do that and share this message with other people, then we can be, I think as Steve is saying here, we can be heroes, each one of us really can be heroes uh, because this is, uh, th these ideas we're talking about are not just abstract intellectual concepts. We're talking about the life on this earth, for us and for our children, there's nothing more urgent and more critical for us to make an effort to understand and to bring our lives into alignment with and to share with other people, as skillfully as we can, the impacts, the consequences of animal agriculture and the mentality of domination and exploitation of other beings that is basically we've inherited. It's not our fault, it's just what's here when we got here. We're born into it, and so we've all been wounded by it. And so there's no point in blaming or criticizing or shaming anyone, really. We've all been wounded. The whole idea, I think, is to heal uh, ourselves and help others to heal. And I think as we do that, we are creating the, the awakening and the healing that needs to happen. And that, I think, is the, uh, the heroism that's involved. And I think it really is a, a certain quality of heroism because we, we, we risk a lot by expressing ourselves honestly in this society. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't want to hear this message that, that uh, there's a lot of powerful forces that make a lot of money on violence and disease. So for us to stand up and express ourselves and to create communities of love and healing uh, is truly, it's a very heroic thing. So I think it's a, a very good uh, title. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. You know, one of the joys of being on a one of the joys of being on a panel like this is that you have people who come from very different backgrounds talking about things and you discover that there may be overlap in their work in ways they didn't expect. My background is that I'm a physician and I am a professor at a medical school. But I'm at root, what I am is a scientist. And what I spend a lot of time doing is looking for phenomena in our natural world and trying to explain it. And my expertise is in superbugs. And one of the interesting things I found is that these superbugs, drug-resistant microbes, are popping up 
in places that we never expected them to. And some of those relate to the foods that we eat. I grew up in Florida where the orange groves are really important to the economy. And it turned out that we're seeing more and more superbugs in the soil surrounding the, these orange groves. Now, why would that be? Turns out that we're pumping these orange groves full of antibiotics that were once designed to treat syphilis and tuberculosis. This was a front page story in the New York Times. Why would that be? Well, it protects the crops. And I'm going to introduce you to some places where we're going to find problematic use of antibiotics pertaining to food choices. And what I have found in my research and what I write about is that whenever you hear about something like this that doesn't make sense, there's usually a very powerful lobbying group behind it that's making sure that it keeps happening. And so the idea that you can be a hero, well, what you can do is educate yourself and become an advocate. And I don't want to freak people out <clears throat> or talk about too many things to stress you out. I mean, you got to eat something. Um, but talking about things that we know we could do a better job with. You know, another aspect of this is meat-producing animals, chickens, pigs, livestock. We have been pumping them full of antibiotics, not just because it makes them healthier, but it actually makes the meat on the bones bigger. And there's a very powerful lobbying group behind that that we, a, a group that I was a part of, was able to take on and was able to limit the amount of antibiotics that we give to these animals. And we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of superbugs associated with these animals. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And I want to make sure we have time to talk about all the different ways that these superbugs form. But the gist of it is that any time a bacterium is exposed to an antibiotic, it can evolve, it can mutate. Some of the bacteria will die, but some will survive. And when they survive, they can come back stronger and they can be difficult to treat. And just to hit on one thing that's in the headlines now that has to do with our food choices, some of you have heard of this Wuhan virus, this novel coronavirus that's causing the stock market to go haywire and people are quarantined, 50 million people. Well, that originated in a meat market in China. I've traveled the world studying some of the most deadly viruses, including Ebola virus and Nipah virus, and many of these, between human outbreaks, we try to figure out where do they go. I talked about this this afternoon. Ebola virus will kill 300 people, 3,000 people, and then it will disappear for 30 years. Well, where does it go? Turns out that it lives in bats, as do many other dangerous viruses. And if you find yourself in a Chinese meat market and someone offers you bat soup, you should think twice about it. That's where we think that this most recent outbreak happened, that there are animals that harbor all kinds of pathogens uh, that I end up seeing in my clinic or in my emergency room because people took an adventurous tour to eat some unusual foods. I'm not a dietitian, I'm not an expert in nutrition, but I have a lot of thoughts about how antibiotics and about how Big Pharma contributes to some of the deadly pathogens that I see when pe people come into my emergency room asking for help. So uh, I don't think you've overstated the aims of this. Uh, if people could walk away more informed about food choices and become advocates, uh, I think that is an act of heroism, so absolutely. Uh, just quickly before we move on, just due to the urgency of it, what is the actual steps that we should take to avoid antibiotic resistant bacteria problems? So I'm going to talk about other things, but just to get that out of the way, what, what are the actual solutions that we should be doing? Well, the, the first thing is to know your risk. How dangerous are superbugs to you? If you have a normally functioning immune system, they're not that big of a deal. I have a normally functioning immune system and I walk into the emergency room every single day treating patients with superbug infections and I'm okay. What I see are people who have medical conditions that alter their immune system or take medications that weaken their immune system and they put them at risk and they don't know it. They don't know that they have a medical condition that leaves them vulnerable. There are undoubtedly superbugs in this room, but you're not going to be harmed by them. There are 5% of doctors have superbugs on their white coats. Terrifying statistic until you realize that you've got so many different ways to protect yourself from your skin, your immune system, uh, a variety of mechanisms within your body. 
Now, when my father-in-law got cancer and went on chemotherapy, he became high risk. And we took all sorts of precautions. So the idea that you read an article in the newspaper that says that somebody swabbed the meat in the frozen, you know, the frozen meat section and that it was teeming with superbugs, well, you're going to bring that home and put it on the grill. Those superbugs are going to die and you're going to be okay. So it's a very sophisticated issue that can be simplified down to having a conversation with your doctor and saying, how's my immune system? And if your doctor can't answer that, I tell people, maybe you should get a new doctor. And um, I think, oh. I think it's also uh, important to, um, to realize, I remember uh, doing research on uh, the antibiotic resistance and basically about 15 years ago, the statistic was that 50% of all antibiotics that are manufactured are given to humans and 50% are given to livestock. And then it went up to 60% and then to, to livestock and then 70% and then 80%. The last I read was between 85 and 90% of all antibiotics that are manufactured are not for humans, they are for imprisoned cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, goats, and, and other animals that are imprisoned for food. So this is really uh, obviously where most of the antibiotics are being used and where most of the antibiotic resistance is happening. And so it, it's very clear, I think, at a fundamental level that animal agriculture is demonic in the sense that it's, uh, it's, uh, perver it's a perversion at the, and a, a terrible transgression at the foundation of human society that we're imprisoning all these animals completely unnecessarily for food. There are no nutrients that we need to be healthy that we have to imprison and kill animals to get. Right? I've been a vegan for 40 years. I've not been to a doctor in 40 years. I've stayed out of the medical establishment completely. <laughs> and, and I'm not the only one. I mean, in, in general, if we have a strong immune system for eating healthy food and exercising properly and having a positive mental attitude, I mean, health is very complex. There's many factors involved. It's not just food, obviously. There's many factors. But uh, if we're really uh, living our lives, I think, as, as best we can with awareness and consciousness and kindness and so forth, then we have a foundation for health. And animal agriculture destroys the health of billions of animals, right? And that's what it's all about. It's confining these animals. They're living in toxic environments. They have high rates of disease, of cancer. Uh, that's why all these antibiotics are used and all kinds of medications. Over 10,000 different drugs and hormones and chemicals that have been approved to be used on these animals. So they're very sick. And then we're eating these sick animals and we get sick. And so our immune systems are, very, are compromised, obviously, by this. But we're also sowing, and you think about it, from the point of view of as we sow, we reap. If we're doing something that is so perverse and violent and unnatural to imprison animals, and this earth is beautiful and abundant, there's no reason for us to be imprisoning billions of animals in hell holes uh, for any reason. It's something that's been going on. It's been happening. We're born into it. But it's really past time for us to awaken and uh, respond to this in a way to bring it to an end because this, this, this superbug problem is just one of, of hundreds of devastating impacts that are harming us on every level. I mean, everywhere we turn, we see human justice problems that are caused essentially by animal agriculture, starvation and hunger, which is unnecessary because we're growing plenty of food to feed everyone. Uh, there's, there's countless ramifications of this, and this is just one, but to uh, really clearly understand this and then share these ideas with other people in a way that they can understand and hopefully awaken out of this uh, cultural trance that's really injected into all of us from the time we're born here, where we've been forced to eat animal foods, and to realize that this, this has to be the last generation that engages in this perverse behavior and to now awaken out of it. I think that's, that's the essential solution to this problem. I would just add, um, well, First a comment and then a question. So the comment is that last year 30,000 Americans died from antibiotic resistant infection, bacterial infections, 800,000 people worldwide. And that problem is forecast to accelerate as more bugs become antibiotic resistant. But Matt, I did want to ask you, um, thanks to your work, um, Will just quoted the statistic of the percentage of antibiotics that are used in livestock going up and up and up, and last I had heard it was 80% as well. 
but um, has that actually gone down? What, do you know what the current number is? Uh, so we've made progress with certain animals and taken dramatic steps back with others. So cows, we're having some problems. Chickens, we're doing a little bit better. Um, again, a lot of this has to do with the lobbying groups. Um, the, the thing I will say is that, you know, we come from very different perspectives. You know, I'm essentially the medical establishment. I went to Harvard Medical School, I teach at a medical school, and I agree with every single thing you said. Um, it's not uh, talked about. Uh, uh, I, I believe that nutrition and diet gets maybe half of a day in medical school lectures for the entire curriculum, but absolutely the ways to protect yourself are things that have to do with the holistic view of your body. You know, getting a good night's sleep, cutting out alcohol, eating a plant-based diet, these things can really go a long way, um, a lot farther than some of the supplements that people ask me about. Um, and not to say that there are they don't work, but to say that, you know, I, I really just, I was struck by what you were saying uh, in terms of how to view this problem. And even though we come at it from different places, uh, there is a whole lot of overlap. Um, just to clarify, did you say that 80% of all antibiotics that are used are used in animals, is that, is that what you said? In, in the United States, 66% worldwide was the last statistic I had heard, yeah, but the, I don't know the, I don't. I actually don't have the most recent data on this. One of the challenges we have is we don't have a good handle. We have a good handle on how many antibiotics doctors are prescribing. We don't have a great handle on dentists. We're trying to do a better job of understanding that. And we also don't know how many people are getting antibiotics illicitly on the black market. You know, it's not that hard to go to get antibiotics in Mexico. Um, and so we don't really know the full scope of the problem, but the numbers that you're citing, uh, are very concerning and they, they sound accurate. So worldwide, are we giving more antibiotics to uh, animals than to humans? Yes. Separating the question of whether you should eat animals or not, if you did choose to eat animals, is it necessary to give them antibiotics to grow it? If someone wanted to raise chickens and cows and pigs, can it be done without giving them antibiotics? Yes, certainly can. Uh, it's more uh, a, you look at these places that do large scale uh, meat producing animals, they have this huge organization, this huge process where they are essentially jailed, as you mentioned, and they pump them full of antibiotics to make them as big as possible. But it is not an essential aspect of their lives that they need these antibiotics. Okay, let's go to the the, the shocking article that came out 15 or so years ago about the relation between animals and climate change. Let me read a paragraph. Climate change emissions from meat production are far higher than currently estimated, according to a con controversial new study, although this is from like 15 years ago, that will fuel the debate on whether people should eat fewer animal products to help the environment. In a paper published by a respected U.S. think tank, the World Watch Institute, two World Bank environmental advisors claim that instead of 18% of global emissions being caused by meat, the true figure is 51%. So do you, so you want to comment on that? Because according to this, uh, is, is, I don't know what the follow-up was since then, but they're saying that where everyone believes that cars and um, trucks are causing all the the climate change, this is claiming that 51% of climate change or greenhouse gas emissions are caused by the whole system of eating animal products. Well, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I think 18% is a lot. It's actually more than the transportation sector. And that's the figure I'm more comfortable citing. I think that the report from World Watch was compelling and interesting, but the researchers I know, and I'm not qualified to dig into this level of research personally, so it's kind of who do I trust that is, that spends years and decades on it, that's their life's work. But the people that I know that have dug in feel that 51% uh, is probably overstated, if you want to be literal about it, but I think that 18% is quite credible and it could be higher. One of the big questions is how do you factor in what the land would have been doing if it wasn't being used for livestock? 
And if it was in forest, or if it was in certain types of ecosystem that are going to be carbon sinks, that are going to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, then that's a fa something we have to consider. And if you consider that perhaps in the mix we might say, what is the impact of chopping down and burning tropical rainforest and turning that into cattle pasture, then obviously the carbon impact of that is absolutely massive. But if you're taking land that was already grassland and cattle are grazing or you're growing grain or soy to feed to cattle in feedlots and so forth, um, I think generally you can look at numbers different ways. 51% feels pretty high. Humans are doing a lot to impact climate change, but there's no question agriculture is massive and it's the single thing we can have the greatest impact on the most rapidly. I mean, it's, uh, a person would be better off driving a Hummer as a vegan from a climate perspective than, uh, you know, driving a Prius or a, a, one of the, a Tesla um, and eating meat just from an environmental perspective. And in fact, one study said that you'd be better off driving than walking if you're fueling your walking calories with a steak. So, um, so there's no question, from a pure climate impact perspective, so there's no question it's big any way you slice it. But I think when we look at what that 100% is, there are so many things that go into it, so many different human activities that are impacting the climate that I think it's more than just, we can't just put it all on agriculture. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I would agree uh, with that. I, although I think um, the credentials actually of these uh, two scientists uh, were better than the United Nations scientists who came up with the 18%. They, had, they were more senior scientists who came up with the 51%. And uh, I, read their, I read the rebuttals and the rebuttals to the rebuttals. You had to pay a lot of money to see those articles online. And I decided to pay it because I wanted to find out. And um, I personally, uh, and I'm not an expert either, but you know, I have a, in my PhD work, I did quite a bit of uh, quantitative and qualitative research analysis courses and things. And my feeling is that the 51% is really uh, absolutely true, actually, if you're going to look at because they, they justified the 51%, I thought, very well with land use, uh, as you were saying, Ocean. And Jeff Anhang, he was one of the two uh, researchers, uh, has been recently in touch with um, Nelson Campbell uh, and saying that actually the 51% is really too low. He, he could do, he said if he could get funding, which he, it's very difficult to get, he could do more research that would show that the 51% is really uh, too low. It's actually much higher than that. So I think you, you, can't under, you can't really overstate the devastating impact of animal agriculture in terms of, I don't want to just limit it to climate because climate is one aspect which is you know, important, but I mean, destruction of rainforest, destruction of habitat for wildlife. We're in the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. I mean, we're losing the, the genetic wisdom of our planet on a massive scale. Humanity is attacking the, the, the library of, of knowledge of, of genetics here, causing hundreds of species to go extinct every day, according to the people who are studying this. And it's driven by animal agriculture, destroying these rich uh, environments, the oceans and the rainforests where, where animals and plants and all, you know, beings live, uh, and destroying uh, virtually everything, aquifers, soil, all of that. So when we take it as a large package, uh, and, and the climate is included in that, it, it becomes overwhelming. And again, we just don't hear about it because of the, the bias in the media uh, away from anything that will make the advertisers unhappy. One thing I'll add to this about the, the changing climate is that as an infectious disease specialist, we're seeing new pathogens, new microbes that are appearing in New York State that we never have before. Uh, I'm a fungal expert, and that many fungal infections are what we call geographically localized, that you don't see them outside of certain climates. And an example I'll give you is that there's something called blastomyces, which has never been in New York before. And as of 2018, it's here. And that's because the climate has altered to make it a hospitable one for them. So now when we're in, on rounds in the morning, we're now discussing whether the patient with, 
what looks like a fungus could have blastomyces. And this is something that we can reverse. We have an opportunity, it's not too late, to change things so that many of these pathogens, these microbes, go back to their home environments. Um, but as the climate continues to alter, uh, we're going to be seeing more and more new threats popping up here uh, and in the surrounding areas. Um, I'd like I to feel read. sort of odd to clap after something like that. Yeah, you don't have to <laughs> clap after what I said. But I guess we appreciate when truth is spoken, That's right? right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I would like to read three statements, and I'd like for you to tell me what our diet has to do with any of this. Number one, tropical coral reef coverage around the world has declined by 30 to 50% since the 1980s. Nearly 75% of the world's reefs face threats from pollution, habitat destruction, overfishing, and increasingly a changing climate that increases temperatures, sea level, and acidity in the oceans. Next, point two. Ocean acidity has increased 30% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This increases 100 times faster than any change in acidity experienced by marine organisms for at least the last 20 million years. Number three. Um, Largest ever Gulf dead zones reveal stark impacts of industrial agriculture. A new survey of the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico sounds alarm and points to extreme overuse of toxic chemicals from farms and CAFOs. So the three things I'm mentioning is that coral reefs one, ocean acidification two, and dead zones in the ocean three. What does this have to do with our diet, any of these things? Yeah, I think, again, this is a, a direct result of animal agriculture. It's pretty obvious. We lived in an RV for 17 years, traveling all over the, North America. And uh, I'm telling you, I mean, most of this of North America has been uh, reduced to vast monocropped fields of genetically engineered corn and soy, primarily alfalfa and other feed grains for imprisoned animals. Especially, people don't think of it, but vast areas of, for example, Mississippi and other states grow uh, genetically engineered corn and soy to feed to factory farm catfish. Fish eat a huge amount of grain also, factory farmed fishes. So all, these, so, so all of these uh, monocrop fields, these are killing fields. I mean, nothing is allowed to grow except one species. It's the complete opposite of nature. Nature is, wants to have a party. You know, when nature says, let's have, let's have lots of it, you know, let's have a whole complex ecosystem. And monocropping is the result of 10,000 years of animal agriculture, the mentality of, of, of a war against nature, basically. A war against animals, a war against life. And so we just now do plant agriculture the way we do animal agriculture, and so we don't allow anything to live on that land. So we have you know, thousands of acres where any uh, animal that tries to live there, you kill them. Any plant other than the corn or soy that tries to live there, you kill them. Any insects that might get in the way, you kill them. It's killing everything. And so all of the uh, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides end up in the water. But more, and even more importantly, in some ways, uh, the, the chemical fertilizers, because the transition is away from soil to oil. So the foundation of agriculture, as the, as the topsoil gets destroyed, when, when the Europeans came here, there was like 15 to 20 feet of topsoil in the United It was incredibly rich. Now we're down to just inches. And so uh, we're using uh, petroleum, basically natural gas, to create nitrogen fertilizer that then creates what's called eutrophication of the water. It, 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 uh, it's it's nutrient-rich runoff from all of this nitrogen fertilizer accumulating, for example, in the Mississippi River from, from the whole heartland of the United States and going into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's these dead zones where uh, nothing can live because of the algae blooms, which when they bloom, they suck the oxygen out of the water. And so any marine animals that are living there, they either have to leave and get out of there if they, if they can, but usually, or they die. And the algae also, besides basically creating a huge dead zone where nothing can live, nothing can survive, and when it dies, it creates a huge amount of acid in the water and contributes to the acidification of the oceans. And this acidification of the oceans uh, is destroying shellfish, their capacity to, uh, to make shells and coral reefs and so forth. So animal agriculture demands massive amounts of grain, because these animals, really, they're eating machines. They eat huge quantities, cows uh, especially, but all these animals eat, uh, need to eat an enormous amount to fatten them up. 
And uh, so we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. This is the beautiful thing. The reverse of this is the good news that we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. And I mean, farther away. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and allow these dead zones to heal. And and the and the huge dead zone. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's only one of about 50 to 70 major dead zones all around the world. They're everywhere. It's not just in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's animal agriculture as it spreads uh, worldwide through this proliferation of ConAgra and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and Monsanto and all these companies. We're seeing these dead zones uh, also spreading and the acidification and destruction of ocean habitat. It's all driven by animal agriculture essentially and the wastefulness, the extreme wastefulness uh, of animal agriculture, essentially. Um. Yeah, and just to add what Will said, um, just to add to that, that we're overfishing the oceans, which was actually mentioned in one of the articles there, but, um, you know, we are, we're strip mining the oceans. It's not like, you know, a couple family members go out and fish by the creek on the Sunday afternoon. It's like giant Percy nets miles long that strip mine the ocean and catch everything in their path, including a lot of what's called bycatch, creatures that are killed because they happen to be swimming in the vicinity of creatures that humans want to eat. And uh, this is profoundly unsustainable. Um, and in fact, um, while fish stocks were going down, we're populating the ocean with something else, which is plastic. So by current estimates, by the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans by weight than fish. And so some of the fish, of course, eat that plastic, and then they die, which is accelerating the problem, as well as the fact that obviously some of these toxins end up in their bodies, and so humans who eat them can be contaminated with all manner of toxins from that as well, because it, it, it goes up the food chain. Um, and you know the, the reality also is that climate change could threaten to wreak havoc on our oceans in even further ways, um, even beyond what we're just describing, um, including the potential that it could shut down the Gulf Stream, which could create massive impact on fish all up and down, the, all throughout the Atlantic. Um, so, you know, we, we're facing some real challenges here, but I think what's, what's hopeful and what's heartening and what's inspiring is that we actually have the capacity to make a huge difference on all these issues through simple changes to diet and lifestyle that happen to also make us healthier. Uh, I just want to add one more thing. I thanks Ocean for talking about the ocean overfishing because I think most people don't realize this and um, I think it's very important to understand that the reason the overfishing is such a problem is we're not just catching fish for humans to eat, we're catching fish f to feed uh, animals. That scientists discovered if you enrich the feed uh, that's given to cows and pigs and chickens, they give more milk, they give more eggs, they fatten up more quickly. So these animals, like cows for example, that are just designed to eat grass, uh, no, 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 we don't want that because if they're e eating grass, they, they don't fatten up that much, they don't give much milk, so we enrich their feed with uh, with, with legumes like alfalfa and soy and, 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 then, and grains like corn, which is, they're not designed for. It makes them very sick. And they get E. coli actually because of that and, and it makes us sick too. But we don't stop there. We make them eat uh, meat, right? So these cows are eating huge amounts of fish meal, for example. It's standard to, to mix fish meal <clears throat> into, the, into the grain that is fed to cows, also to chickens, and other types of meat are, are mi mixed in. But the, the fish populations are being uh, so devastated because of this basic factor. From, for example, from the late 1980s, uh, since that time, every year, the fishing capacity has increased. We have more ships, bigger ships, better technology to catch more fish every year since the late 1980s. So that's gone up every year. Every year since the late 1980s, the tonnage of fish that is caught because that's all they measure is tonnage, really. They don't measure individuals. Every year, it's gone down. So every year, even though the, the capacity has increased, the amount of fish that are caught has decreased. That's why 
roughly two-thirds of all fish that are eaten in the United States are uh, factory farm, basically from aquaculture operations and about half worldwide because the oceans are basically destroyed. They're, they're collapsing. Oceanographers say that by the, the, uh, by the late 40s or, or early 50s, there won't be any, virtually any fish left at the rates we're going. And it's this incredible demand for fish, not just to feed us, but to feed to livestock. And then a lot of other fish are actually caught and ground up into fertilizer, for example, and just put on the fields. And, and as Ocean said, the bycatch is a huge problem. So the attack on the oceans is unremitting, and uh, it's, very, it's out of sight in many ways. This is not land. It's like on land, just going across the land and just killing everything, right? That's what we do in the oceans. We go across the oceans and just kill everything. The bottom trawlers, mid-range trawlers, surface trawlers, they wipe out everything, destroy the, uh, the underlying structure of the oceans as well. And with nuclear radiation, of course, and other things, and all the toxic chemicals going into the oceans, heavy metals and PCBs, of course, causing the fish to, to be sick. And so we have these massive die-offs of fish, and the overfishing, and the destruction uh, of ocean habitat, and the demand for fish being astronomical. You know, the number of fish that we're catching, they try to put a number on it every year. Uh, and the, the number is estimated to be between two and two and a half trillion fish we're killing every year. I mean, that's a number, it's hard to imagine. They, they estimate that that number of fish, if you put th th these fish like nose to tail, it would go from the earth all the way to the sun. That's how many we're killing every year. The earth, I mean, it's amazing how abundant the earth is. It can actually <laughs> create that many fish every year and we keep killing them uh, to the point where there's not, we're destroying, we're attacking the very essence of life on this earth completely mindlessly. It's completely mindless. We're not even aware of it. The average person has no clue. Uh, it's only, it, it works very well to, to make huge profits for a tiny minority of people who get rich on sick people and on short-term profits for f a few corporations. But veganic agriculture, going to plant-based agriculture that's organic and plant-based, instead of using uh, the techniques that are, have been developed, of monocropping and of pesticides and herbicides and all the GMOs to use cover crops and to use uh, rotation and to use compost and to uh, use ways of rebuilding the soil naturally. This is something we can do and we can, again, feed everyone on a fraction of the land and allow the oceans to heal. There's nothing stopping us. It's, it's just a system that's in place that is toxic and destructive to our health, to the health of the ecosystems, and that we don't understand, except you know, we don't have these kinds of conferences and getting the word out enough. But I think it's really important for all of us to do the best we can to help people understand these things, really. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Steve. I have a question for uh, Will and Ocean, which is, you know, I'm learning a lot just hearing you both talk. And I'm curious if you have a, a top three list or a top one list of what are the things that I think all of us here want to be thoughtful about what we eat. Um, but as I said, we got to eat something. And what are the things, the tangible things that we can do that are a step in the right direction? You know, I often counsel people on, I say, here are the things I would do that you can easily do to improve your health. Do you have a primary care doctor? Do you drink alcohol to excess? Do you get a good night's sleep? Do you exercise? Do you do some mindfulness? You know, things like that. What are the things that you recommend to people when they walk out of this hotel that they can do, and myself included, uh, so that we can be more thoughtful about what we eat? Well, um, broadly, I love the Ornish program and the, the simple eat better, stress less, love more, move more. Uh, um, that's basically the same conclusion that Dan Buettner came to when he looked at the blue zones and where people live the longest and healthiest lives around the world when he wrote about that for National Geographic. But looking at the eat better part, more specifically, um, I'd say number one is to substitute beans for beef. I mean, essentially more legumes as a basis for a lot of our protein and core nutrition. Um, ideally sprouted uh, and pressure cooked, um, but, but um, legumes are, are really nutritious and they're affordable and they're low environmental impact per calorie produced. And, um, and then I would, number two, say a lot of vegetables 
like a lot, lot, lot of vegetables. Um, research is telling us that kind of the more vegetables we eat, the better, up to about 10 servings a day. A serving being defined as a half cup cooked or a cup of like salad or something. Up to about 10 servings a day, you get massive benefit. After that, it kind of tapers off. There's no harm done if you eat 20 or 30 servings a day, but the benefits go down. But Basically, the more you eat up to 10 servings a day, the healthier you will be, and that's pretty much across every statistical measure with just about every disease known, chronic disease known to humanity. Um, so those are probably the number two things. I could definitely say, you know, getting off of all animal products or certainly the factory farmed ones. I, I said beef because that's the biggest culprit, certainly from an environmental standpoint, from a health standpoint, from an ethical standpoint. You know, all of the um, th all the industrialized animal products are pretty big culprits in a lot of misery. So, um, and then so more more whole plant foods, less processed junk, less sugar, and less animal products. That wasn't exactly three, but those are my core messages. Thank you, Ocean. I you know my feeling is that um, <clears throat> the best thing anyone can do is to really make an effort to understand the consequences of our food choices, uh, all our lifestyle choices, really, in general, and then, and then we'll be motivated uh, to make a positive change. And I think if we, at least from my perspective, make that effort, um, we discover that plant-based foods provide all the nutrients that we need to be healthy and and liberate ourselves and others in, in wonderful ways. And so I think one of the things I, I noticed that people don't seem to understand is that it's important that we get enough calories. Uh, I think starches are really wonderful. So I'm kind of a, a pro, uh, Dr. John McDougall talks about this, and I think he's right, that a lot of people move to a plant-based diet and they're afraid of carbohydrates. So I think complex carbohydrates are fantastic, like potatoes, sweet potatoes, grains, and so forth, legumes, of course, vegetables, uh, and fruits have lots of complex carbohydrates, and, and you need to get plenty of calories, clean calories, but I think organic is critical. Uh, I would really emphasize the importance of, of e paying the extra money and eating organically grown plant-based foods. And uh, the other thing I think that's interesting in this whole thing is that people have this idea, that, well, I'll stop eating red meat and then uh, maybe then give up chicken, and then maybe fish, and then maybe uh, eggs, and then maybe dairy, something like that. But I think in many ways, the most violent and destructive to our health, especially foods, are uh, dairy, eggs, and fish. You know, those three, they're seen by many people to see like they're better somehow. But fish really, uh, enormous suffering that these animals endure, and, the t and, con and they concentrate so many toxins. And dairy, I think, is probably even more violence and suffering in, uh, in cheese than in meat because these poor animals, they're horribly sexually abused. Their babies are stolen. And I've, I've lived in an RV, like I say, and I spent quite a bit of time you know, camping all over the place. And I've heard many times at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I've been within earshot of a dairy and heard the wailing and moaning and almost like screaming of these cows whose babies have been stolen. They go on and on and on. And the heartbreak of these poor cows who have their babies stolen. And um, the just the, to understand the toxicity of dairy products, I mean, it's so... Uh, violent to our bodies to be eating uh, casein, for example. We don't have renin like calves have to break down this protein. It causes mayhem. It causes, you know, type 1 diabetes. There's so many problems directly attributable to, to casein, uh, to IGF-1 growth hormone, which is like throwing gasoline on a fire. If we have cancer cells in our body, it's well understood. The estrogen uh, is destructive on, to our society, the, the, what it does to girls, what it does to boys, what it does uh, to our bodies. Uh, and on so many ways. So dairy, uh, there's no end to the violence and abuse and horror of the dairy industry. And eggs are very similar. Uh, there's a, the most concentrated glob of cholesterol on planet Earth is an egg yolk. And there's nothing really necessary in these foods for, for health. There's a lot of things that are very harmful, enormous amounts of cruelty. You can't think of anything more violent and, and abusive than to be born as a, 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 a hen uh, in a battery cage where you, you can't spread your wings your entire life. Uh, have your beak chopped off uh, as soon as you're a little baby. A lot of little chicks, you know, they die right on the spot. It's extremely painful and shocking to lose the end of your beak. 
and it's chronic pain for the rest of your life. And these animals are abused beyond what we can even begin to imagine in terms of violence. And so we're not only causing violence, we're eating violence, we're eating terror, we're eating despair and anxiety and pain. And the problem with our society, I think, in many ways, is the gross materialism. We, since if we can't measure it scientifically, we say it doesn't exist. This is based on 10,000 years of animal agriculture, which has basically just shut us down to the reality that we're eating suffering and misery and that there's a, a reality to that and we're feeding that to our children. And how can we cr have relationships of harmony between men and women, for example, when the most basic activity that we're engaging in of eating animal foods is based on massive sexual violence and domination of female animals, of, of breaking the bond between the mother and her offspring. And this is the foundation of animal agriculture is as soon as a mother gives birth to a baby, she wants to love and nurture that baby on any uh, animal operation. It doesn't matter, backyard operation, commercial farm, you always kill the baby, you always steal the baby, you always impregnate her again on a rape rack. And that's, un that's just the reality. It's been like that for 10,000 years. And so the underlying uh, violence in our society that we don't seem to be able to come to terms with in terms of our relationships with each other uh, in families and, uh, and between nations and so forth, you can trace it. There's an old saying in China. When I was in China, I've been to China quite a few times, and there's an old saying, it goes way back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, they say, the saying is, uh, if you want to know why there are wars, listen to the cries that come from the slaughterhouse at night. And that's an ancient saying, and it, it underlies the reality, I think, that um, these animal-based foods, especially the ones that especially violate the female animals, like eggs uh, and dairy products, I think they, they concentrate so many both physical toxins, and what I refer to uh, in the World Peace Diet as metaphysical toxins, and there's a reality to this that uh, we are, I think, beginning to realize. And so the good news is that the more we move toward uh, a whole food, organic, plant-based diet, the healthier and happier we'll be. And uh, I would just suggest people to just do the best they can to move in that direction and question the narrative that is compelling them not to do it, actually. Yeah. Thank you for those answers. Uh, I switched two years ago to a plant-based diet, and it was really hard for me because, well, because I have a real sweet tooth, but I also love... Uh, I grew up in the South where red meat was essential. And so the way that I've been able to do it is that I have to distract myself. So when I'm at work, I get two en enormous salads and I open up a medical journal and I eat. And it's not a very thoughtful way of doing it, but it's a way for me to not sit there and think, oh, I'm eating something that's not as good as that cheeseburger. So I don't know how that fits in, but it, I found that I have more energy uh, and I did lose some weight by doing that switch. So uh, I, it was not easy, but I'm, I, and it, again, none of this is in medical school. Uh, we don't teach it in medical school. Um, and my hope is that we can somehow figure out a way to include this because it, it's essential. So. The one thing I, I, sh I should just mention, I, was, I listened to Michael Clapper give a talk and he was saying how um, he ran into a friend of his, Kim Williams, who's the, he I think he's the head of the cardiology, the, uh, the heart, the heart uh, car American uh, Cardiology Institute, something like that. He's a very well-known cardiologist and he's a vegan. And he's uh, the head of a hospital, a cardiology department of a large hospital in Chicago. And so he said, how are you doing, Kim? And, and, and he didn't look like he was too happy. And they talked about it and apparently, as the head of the cardiology unit, he had been gradually, over the, over the months and years, bringing more and more cardiologists into his department who were plant-based and teaching uh, and, and sharing this idea that they should get the, uh, their patients, instead of giving them a quadruple heart bypasses, to get them to move to a plant-based way of eating and solving the problem that way. And he was saying that just uh, like the week before, he'd been called in to the, the head of the hospital and they were really upset with him. And they said, listen, you know, for, for years and years, the cardiology unit of this hospital was the biggest money maker. We made the most money. He said, what you're doing, we can't tolerate this. I mean, the, the profits have just collapsed. You can't do this anymore. And he was thinking, you know, what am I gonna do? And 
And, um, and that was sort of the, the, that's the dilemma, essentially, for, the, 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 um, for, for many hospitals that are really based on making their profits from disease. There are some, I think, like Kaiser and maybe some others, where uh, it's more of a subscription. I, you know, I, don't, I don't have insurance. I don't know anything about this. But anyway, I guess the, the, the hospital is uh, more, incur they do better if people are healthier. I guess that, that would be the way to go. Because he said he had... Uh, dinner later, a, a few weeks later, with a, an insurance guy. And the insurance guy was saying that they understand now that people who are eating a plant-based diet are so much healthier, and so they're gonna, they're, the insurance company is going to start pressuring the hospitals to change what they're doing so it'll be cheaper for them. So that's kind of maybe the solution to the problem, that's what Michael Clapper was saying. But it's a very interesting dynamic that's happening right now. So I'd like to ask you how our food choices and maybe lifestyle choices affect these five statements. Number one, humanity has wiped out 60% of mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles since 1970, leading the world's foremost experts to warn that the annihilation of wildlife is now an emergency that threatens civilization. Point number two, the world's insects are hurtling down the path to extinction, threatening a catastrophic collapse of nature's ecosystems, according to the first global scientific review. Number three, more than 40% of insect species are declining and a third are endangered, the analysis found. Number four, a UN report says species extinction rates are accelerating and goes on to say nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history, with grave impacts on the people around the world likely. Number five, extinction of wildlife. There are half as many African lions that the, there are half as many African lions than there were 25 years ago. The iconic species has disappeared from 94% of its historic range. So uh, those five things, does, how, does, does, how does our diet and lifestyle have an impact on any of these things? <laughs> All right, well, you know, uh, it's pretty obvious. It, it kind of goes along with what we've been saying. I was in Africa recently, about, about I guess, uh, two years ago, and uh, you can really see it happening in Africa. Uh, there's uh, just, just hard push uh, to, to rapidly increase um, the presence of Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and McDonald's and these other fast food uh, operations and as well as Monsanto is pushing hard to get in there and so what this is leading to essentially is a, a, a radical and massive change on the African continent where uh, elephants which and all the animals giraffes and zebras and hippopotamus and, and, and virtually all these animals uh, were allowed to live they weren't they weren't they nobody was really I mean hunters were sometimes hunting them but now uh, we see that they are considered pests. They, their, their status has really changed. The local farmers are now just killing them. They hate them. They hate the elephants. They hate the lions. They try to destroy them. They, they're just out to kill them all off. They want to kill them all off because they're interfering with their, ag animal, with, their, with, their, with their fields of genetically engineered corn and soy and alfalfa and so forth that they need to feed to their cows and pigs and chickens. So the... the we have to understand that, you know, that animal agriculture is a war against wildlife. We could see it so clearly when we were there. And uh, it, it has to uh, somehow, I think perhaps maybe as Americans, you know, the, the interesting thing is that we still wherever we go, all over the world, Asia, Africa, Europe, even um, most places, the United States is still held up as the culture that everyone wants to copy. They want to, you know, the, 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 our music they like, our movies they like, our food they want to eat the same food. So really, as, Amer as people living in the United States, every one of us who moves to a, a plant-based way of eating, we, when we go vegan, we have a massive impact on the whole planet, really. There are people, are, people still look to the United States for, for leadership, and it's, it's the American fast food empire as it moves out into the rest of the planet that's really wreaking havoc and causing this massive extinction of species that we're hearing about. So I think as, a, as people living in the United States, we have an obligation to try to change that in some way, to try to be an example of kindness and caring and respect for, for life and, and environmental responsibility 
by, as a country, really questioning this. Uh, and it's very urgent. I mean, it's so critical. Uh, there's some estimates that say with it, just within the next 10 years, virtually all of wildlife will be gone. And if it gets to that, you know, we're going to be next. I think you can't keep sowing the seeds of extinction without reaping that ourselves. And the irony is that we're so clueless. Most people don't understand. We'll go extinct and we won't even know why it happened. You know, that's really, in a sense, the great tragedy if we do uh, continue on this path. Uh, but as Ocean was saying, you know, I think it's important to realize that there's a beautiful uh, positive future that's also beckoning. And we can question this uh, model of animal agriculture that's destroying not only our physical health, but the health of wildlife and, and uh, move toward uh, a positive future and to do it here in this country. For example, I think we should really be aware, I, I think I mentioned it during my talk, but the United, USDA Department of Wildlife Services is killing millions of animals, hundreds of millions of animals uh, with our taxpayer dollars at the request of ranchers and farmers every year. Coyotes and bobcats and bears and, and a lot of birds, millions of birds are killed because they are seen to interfere uh, with, uh, with livestock and with uh, grains that are needed for livestock and so forth. So it's happening in this country. It's happening all over the world. It's always been happening. Animal agriculture has always been a war against wildlife. And, and this is what, what you're talking about uh, in, in this whole thing. The, uh, the thing, I'm, I'll just say this one last final thing, that 10,000 years ago, uh, for the very first time, as I met and talk about in the World Peace Diet, we started animal agriculture. There was no animal agriculture, as far as we can tell, until 10,000 years ago in what is today Iraq. People, for the first time, started to own wild sheep and goats and then cows uh, as property for food. That's called herding. And so 10,000 years ago, human beings were 1% of the biomass on planet Earth and uh, on land, and, and free-living animals were 99% of the biomass and um, of the weight. Basically, you the, mean weight. the animal weight. Right? Animal weight, yeah. yeah. So they were 99% of the weight, and human beings, we were 1% of the weight. Today, just 10,000 years later, which is just a few seconds really in geological time, we are now human beings and our livestock, and the, the animals we own as property, um, are now 98% of the biomass. And wild animals are 2%. It's, we, we've basically taken the whole earth away from them. We've stolen it from them, and we've used it to, to basically take, you know, their, their habitat is gone, and we're using it for cows and pigs and sheep and other animals, and the oceans, it's even worse. So this is the situation, and if we don't turn it around, we're, I, it's very obvious that we're, we're not really deserving to live here. I mean, we're not deserving to live on a planet if we're going to destroy the life here. I mean, if, if the creator created this beautiful planet, and all we do is just destroy it, well, you know, why are we here? That's not our purpose. We've lost our purpose because we've stolen the purposes of animals. So we have to give them back their purpose for us to have our purpose. We have to liberate animals for us to, uh, for us to be liberated. I'll, I'll add to that. Um, you mentioned Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's in Africa. Um, I worked in Africa quite a bit studying infectious diseases. And the new trend in my field is now to go to Africa not to study HIV or tuberculosis, but to study heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure for this reason, that the, the infiltration of, of these fast food places um, has been very detrimental. And we're recreating a number of the studies that we've done <clears throat> in the United States. There's a very large one called the Framingham Heart Study, which established the risk factors we have for heart disease. And now what we're doing is redoing that Framingham study in countries all over the world, in Haiti uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa, because of uh, this change that we have been the leaders in changing the culture. And I think what we're hearing is that we can be the leaders uh, in reversing that and to go into a more positive direction. Yeah. Well said. So we're seeing this collapse of insects and pollinators. And what a lot of people don't really think about too much is that we're spraying our fields with pesticides that kill bugs. And then we scratch our heads and wonder why insects are dying in droves when these pesticides are rampant, not just in our fields, but in our water, in our ecosystems. And we're also killing microorganisms. As much as we in our livestock weigh, we're still massively outweighed by bacteria. But we're killing this bacteria and the bacterial, 
bacteriological diversity of the Earth, both by ravaging natural ecosystems and also by poisoning those that we manage with all these pesticides and monocrops. And so um, the result is that the bacteriological diversity of this world is plummeting, and this directly impacts our own microbiome. There's no good conclusive way to measure it, but it's pretty clear that the average human has a fraction of the diversity of bacteria in our digestive tracts that humans did generations back. And partly that's obviously from antibiotics, which kill a whole lot of little critters. But it's also because we're not exposed to dirt, we're not playing with healthy dirt, we're not touching soil, we're not touching diverse ecosystems, we're living in cubicles, we're living in houses surrounded by plastic. And we're eating food that has been fundamentally sterilized uh, and, and is somewhat dead. And so um, one of my friends, Zach, Dr. Zach Bush, triple board certified MD, he takes his patients and he actually prescribes to them to go uh, sit in a swamp, to go s immerse their bodies in a mountain stream, he, he's found like healthy, beautiful ecosystems near him, and he tells his patients to go spend time there so they can replenish their microbiome, so they can connect with that living, healthy soil. And the beautiful thing is that it doesn't take long for this, these, these organisms to replenish. They're really good at spreading. So um, it's interesting when we think about superbugs and antibiotic-resistant bacteria and all the critters we're scared of, but then you're also coming back, Matt, to the fact that a healthy immune system is the best defense, right? Not killing all the bad guys, but being able to have a healthy body that responds well. And the, one of the keys to that is that diversity in the microbiome. It's like the biggest frontier, I think, of medical science is understanding what's going on in our own bodies. And by the way, the microbiome isn't just in your gut. It's also on your skin. It's everywhere that you interact with the world around you. Technically, your intestines are actually the outside of your body because your body hasn't yet taken them in. I mean, you've swallowed it, but it hasn't actually gotten through into your bloodstream. And so the microbiome is that precious interface, sometimes only one cell thick between what is us and what's not us. And having healthy and diverse bacteria living there turns out to be essential to our well-being and survival. So when we talk about the insects and the pollinators and the role they play, I can't help but think that they're deeply connected to the health of the soils and ultimately to the health of our own bodies. It's a great message. It's a great message, Ocean. What you're basically saying is we should embrace the world around us and that we shouldn't be hiding away in cubicles, as you said. And one of the things that I wrestle with as a parent is, and I talked about this this afternoon, is how much to expose my children to. Uh, I grew up in Alabama playing in dirty sandboxes, and I think that was probably good for me. And there was an article that went viral earlier this year by a journalist that said, you should let your son pick his nose. <laughs> and I, I was sitting with my wife not long ago, and we looked over, and my son picked his nose and ate it. <laughs> and my wife, who's a kidney transplant doctor, turned to me and goes, eh, maybe it's good for him. <laughs> and, and so I don't know, but what we're, it's an active area that we're studying is what should we expose people to? You know, we don't want to siphon people away and make everyone a bubble boy. Um, but we also don't want to put you in harm's way. And one way to figure that out is actually through the microbiome research that Ocean just alluded to. So the collection of the trillions of bacteria that are on us, that are on each and every one of us, we're using artificial intelligence and we're using deep sequencing to figure out what collection of bacteria are associated with certain diseases, like diabetes and Alzheimer's, but also what collection of bacteria are associated with health benefits people who live longer, people who are more healthy, who have intact immune systems. Is there some collection of bacteria that is essential to living a healthy life? And I can tell you there are a lot of resources being poured into that right now to try to sort that question out. Yeah, and I think, uh, thank you, that's, that's so, I think, you know, just in the last, uh, as you're saying, maybe last 10 years, we've seen this explosion of interest in the microbiome. And I think it reflects, and, and also the interest that's coming back, uh, again, more into the public awareness of, the, of healthy soil and the importance of building a healthy soil as a healthy foundation for growing food. And then realizing that we have trillions of cells in our bodies or on our bodies, essentially, that our health depends on them. And I think it's fascinating to see that 
Uh, people had much more fiber in the past than we're eating today. Uh, and a lot more uh, polypeptides, basically plant-based foods, that the, the really, what really seems to make a, a most healthy community inside of us uh, are the plant-based foods that are organic. Because you know, glyphosate, for example, is a broad-spectrum antibiotic. And so if we're eating, uh, even if we're eating a plant-based diet, if it's not organic, we're eating these chemicals that are killing the microbiome. They're really just killing the, the healthy bacteria within, inside of us. If we're eating animal-based foods, we're eating a lot of uh, glyphosate. You know, the, most of the uh, glyphosate is eaten by animals. So it's really important, I think, to, again, see the importance of the quality of the food we're eating, not just for our bodies, but for the community that lives inside of our, our bodies, uh, that our health depends on the, the, this community of, that we call the microbiome which is responsible for, for our digestion. And also, uh, the research is very interesting, I think, the connecting the, the microbiome with, uh, with hormones that bring us uh, inner peace and happiness. And the vagus nerve, which is connected you know, from the microbiome or from the, this area down here up to our brain, which again is seen to be responsible in many ways for our, our moods. Uh, and again, to realize that there's this epidemic of frustration and depression and social anxiety and all these things. And oh, the animals that we're eating, what are, they're experiencing depression and anxiety and frustration and the, what kind of a biome, what, what is this community down here if we're feeding them these foods that are full of toxic chemicals and misery and so forth, it, we're creating a community even inside of us that's experienced perhaps the same kind of a thing. Uh, that it's pretty clear, uh, again, from all the wisdom traditions of, of all time have, have talked about this basic idea of the interconnectedness, that if we treat others with kindness and respect, the, the bacteria in the soil, the fruits, the, the, the uh, trees, the plants, and our own com inner community, it's all interconnected. And uh, we have a science that's very reductionistic and keeps taking things apart. And I think the feminine wisdom is to put things together and see the bigger patterns here. It's really pretty obvious. And to, uh, to question anything that takes away from our basic feminine wisdom of caring about this beautiful planet and that's outside of us and within us and looking beyond the material level to the consciousness, the awareness, um, the, the energy of our being and seeing how, you know, that's really the key thing. And the materialism of, of, of our uh, animal agriculture society uh, in many ways suppresses that from the time we're little kids. We're, we're taught that we live in a, uh, a universe that's essentially meaningless, that, that life just came about through sort of this random mutation of, of who knows what. It, there was a big bang for some reason. It doesn't matter. And our lives don't matter. And nothing matters except just basically that gives all the power to the corporations. That means if we don't have a, a meaning and a purpose because you know, this is the basic foundation of our society. It's, it's, it's the most toxic story you can imagine. But this is what we're teaching our children. This is what pervades our educational system. It's the story of animal agriculture, of just no purpose. We don't have a purpose because we steal the purposes of animals. And uh, it creates this foundation where our only meaning comes from consuming. We, the more we can consume, the more status we have, the more our life shows we had meaning. So the more we can come to this planet and destroy everything before we leave and teach our kids to do the same thing, then that means we're successful. That's basically the message of animal agriculture, of the herding culture that's based on dominating and exploiting and oppressing other beings. So it's now had 10,000 years to mature and be, create what we see today. And now what we're seeing, I think, is uh, a transformation. It's beginning to happen, the resurrection of, this, of the feminine dimension of intuition and wisdom that makes the connections and questions this and creates another type of science and another type of religion, another type of education uh, that's based on interconnectedness and respect for the basic truth that what we are is eternal consciousness. We're not just an object that was born and will die. We're not just a piece of meat that's here to struggle and compete against other pieces of meat. That what we are is awareness functioning through a physical body for a few years, but we're here to learn and grow and to help make a, uh, a, an increase in awareness here. And uh, I think this is, this is the wisdom that shines in all of us. And it's really important for us to take time every day to be quiet and listen. Uh, this, the real wisdom does not come from the outside through outside scientific researchers. I mean, forget it. It comes from inside us. 
And if we want to get dirty and connect with the earth, you know, we'll, we'll know how to do it. And we'll connect with the earth and we'll connect with nature and we'll get much stronger and brighter and we'll teach our children to do that because that's our wisdom. We have to take back our power. It's always within us. It's not outside of us and experts. It's in us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like to, uh, again, ask how our food choices um, affect this, these questions. So here's four, four more things I'd like to un understand better. Um, one, isn't it natural for an animal to provide milk? You know, it's what's wrong with us going and milking a cow and getting its milk. It might not hurt them to just get the milk. They've been doing it on farms for a long time. Second, is it true that only pregnant cows provide milk? And as we all think that cows have milk, are we saying that a cow actually doesn't have milk unless, the, unless they're impregnated? Uh, third, are we saying that cows do or don't have antibiotics? In other words, do they add antibiotics to cows? So when we have dairy products, are there antibiotics added to it? And then finally, fish farms, are they adding antibiotics to that? And or, you know, is, is that a good solution? So if you'd comment on our, comment on these things. So he, humans are the only, but so mammal it is a lactating animal, right? With mammary glands. And um, humans are the only mammal that consumes the milk of another mammal. And we're the only mammal that consumes any milk after infancy. So the notion that consuming cow's milk is somehow our biological imperative is rather odd from an evolutionary perspective. Humans have been only, only been doing it for a relative blip of time. And our bodies aren't really well cut out for it, which is why actually a majority of people on the planet are lactose intolerant after infancy. Our, our bodies can handle it when we're little, but then we kind of grow out of it. And um, so there's a lot of racism here with milk, actually, because mostly people of color around the world, generally speaking, it's only people of European descent that are able to handle lactose, typically, um, without getting indigestion. Um, so as far as whether cows, well, they're not actually pregnant necessarily when they're providing milk, but they have been impregnated and they've had babies who were, as, as Will was talking about, taken away from them at one day old. And then they continue to produce milk for quite some time until their production goes down and then they're impregnated again. And it's this continuous cycle and the boys are often turned into veal and the girls are often turned into more milk cows. And so the milk industry is kind of inextricably linked with the whole system. It's very difficult to get away from that. In India, where cows are sacred traditionally, there are cows just running around everywhere and they're not all producing milk all the time because traditionally it was actually considered wrong to kill them. Cows were considered holy and worshipped. So there are just cows all over the place and cow poop all over the place too, I might add, having been there once during a monsoon storm and seen the water turn brown all around me as I walked home from school. Um, but... Um, yeah, let's see, what was your other question? <laughs> um, that image is really stuck in my head now. <laughs> I was really afraid I was going to float away. <laughs> the antibiotics in fish farms? Antibiotics, yes, antibiotics are being used in fish farms. It's pretty dreadful. Um, and I will add also, just so you have this picture in your head, that salmon farms, they're adding food coloring to the salmon farms water because the salmon would be gray otherwise because they're not being fed their natural diet in there. Um, but yes, antibiotics are routinely used in fish farms. They're literally put into the water so the fish will absorb it through their gills. And um, so this is also creating a whole other exposure point for antibiotic resistance, resistant bacteria to develop. Did I address it all? Okay. Thanks, Ocean. I just want to add a couple of things. Oh, a break clap, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, please don't, please don't, please don't stop. <sighs> Um, I remember um, not too long ago, I was talking to a woman about dairy, and she was very well educated. She had a PhD. She was in Los Angeles, and she said, wait a minute. Are you telling me 
that cows don't just give milk? And I said, they're like us. You know, I mean, when a, when a girl grows up to a certain age, she doesn't then reach uh, puberty and then kind of walk down the street squirting milk out of her nipples, you know, <laughs> left and right, because she just, now she can give milk. You know, she gives milk for the same reason, like a cow gives milk for the same reason that a human does. We, we uh, you know, get pregnant, we give birth to a little baby, and the milk is for the baby. And this is something I realize that many people aren't aware of, actually, that basic thing. But I really want to emphasize a couple more things here, because I think it's very important to understand this, that um, cows would naturally live about 25 years. And on any dairy, organic or not, when they are about five years old, maximum, between four and six years old, they're killed. Because their production declines, because they're worn out, because they're kept pregnant and lactating simultaneously. And no mammal is designed to be pregnant and lactating simultaneously. And uh, so when you impregnate, you know, they're brought into heat typically early through pro prolactin and other hormones. And then they give birth to a baby, and as soon as the baby is born, the baby is stolen. And it, irony, the irony is that the baby is then given soy milk, basically, to live, if they're going to keep the baby alive. But usually, mo most often, they just kill the babies, male or female. They, they kill them, or they use them for veal, male or female, they use them for veal. Um, sometimes the males they'll use for beef. Uh, one out of, typically a cow will give birth to four uh, babies and one will be, uh, come a slave on the dairy. The other three, whatever gender they are, will be killed either immediately or shortly thereafter. And typically what they do actually very often nowadays is they'll have, um, uh, impregnate them one more time and send them off to slaughter when they're about eight months pregnant so that they get two for one, basically, at the slaughterhouse so that after they kill the mother and then they uh, open her up, they have a baby in there that they can then, it's very profitable because uh, there's renin in the calf's stomach, the unborn calf's stomach, so they'll take that out uh, for making cheese. You need to coagulate the cheese, and so renin is really, rennet is what is used from the renin in the cat lining of the calf's stomach. But the other thing is uh, there's something called a bovine fet uh, fetal serum that is used in vaccinations. It's also actually ironically used in the cr uh, cr creation of um, cell-based meat. You know, so-called vegan meat is actually made from bovine fetal serum, and they'll put a long needle, you know, into the into the uh, heart of the of the and extract while the baby's still alive, uh, all this stuff, and then they'll kill the baby. So it's a it's an abortion, a really violent abortion process that's done, you know, millions of times on a standard kind of standard procedure now to get more money out of these cows. So um, on a very fundamental level. Um, there's an enormous amount of violence in the dairy industry. It's like I say, it's a violence towards the female and the baby. And so, what we're talking about with veganism, we're talking about ahimsa, which is non-violence. That's the basic idea. And it's kind of interesting because um, there's uh, the Hare Krishna uh, people have been really trying to figure out a way to have milk because they just feel like, well, you know, we should drink milk because uh, Prabhupada, you know, our teacher said, you know, dairy is sacred and the, and the whole thing is dairy is sacred. It's a, and, and so, uh, but they knew there was a lot of violence in the milk. So they decided to create a, a, a farm in uh, West Virginia that where they would have nonviolent milk, ahimsa milk. And, uh, and so it's interesting to read about it because they bought you know, quite a bit of land, they bought some cows, and they started the, the operation of never harming the cows, of loving the cows, of never killing the cows, and selling the milk to, to the other uh, Hare Krishna uh, you know, devotees in the area. And what were they going to do with the males? You know, because they have to keep impregnating them or their milk stops. You know, they have to keep impregnating because the milk will dry up. So half the babies that are born, statistically, are males. So their idea was that they would have the males castrated and use them as oxen. So they could, you know, like that was one of the traditions. But of course, um, after a, f a few oxen, they really didn't need any more. And the neighbors weren't interested. The neighbors said, we have tractors. You can keep your oxen. So they set, had to feed them, basically. And so, uh, and then as the, as the years went by, there were more and more cows that they had to feed. Uh, a lot of them were males, a lot of them got to be too old to give milk, a lot of them were not old enough yet to give milk, so they got to this point where they had, you know, maybe a couple of hundred cows and only maybe 50 were giving milk, the other 150 they had to feed, so the price of their milk was skyrocketing because they had to pay for all, and they needed to buy more land, and they, you know, they had to feed all these cows. 
And uh, finally, they just didn't know what to do. And they, they, they thought, well, you know, uh, the neighbors said that they would take, the neighbors said, well, we'll take your cows. <laughs> and they said, well, you just promise you won't kill them. Oh, don't worry, we won't kill them, you know. <laughs> so that was, that was how, one of the ways they kind of solved the problem was they said, well, don't ask, don't tell. You know, we'll just kind of give them to the neighbors. And of course, the neighbors were getting free meat. And uh, this was for the Ahimsa milk. So you really have to understand clearly, clear as a bell, you cannot have dairy without killing. You know, just really have to understand that. I mean, we, you have to kill the babies because you have to impregnate so many. You can't have the milk without impregnating. And, uh, and we, I saw that when I was in India. You know, it's very clear uh, because you have all these cows wandering the streets and they're, they're starving. They're eating plastic because when their production declines, they just let them go. They either send them to market, which means they get slaughtered in another state where, that allows the slaughtering of cows, or they let them go and they're wandering and they're horribly abused. They get eaten by dogs at night and so forth. I mean, it's really a, a terrible situation for these cows. They have no protection, really. And, um, and the an interesting thing, I think, also is that this dairy cult in India um, is, is all about, you know, everyone is eating dairy. This, the, the white revolution has been promoted by the government to try to push everybody to eat more dairy products. This, the diabetes uh, rate in India has just gone through. They have the highest rate of diabetes in the world now. And the interesting thing also, I think, that's connected probably is that the rate of violence towards women is the highest in the world, in India. You know, Delhi is the most dangerous city in the world to be a woman in terms of getting beaten and abused. Um, there's a direct connection between violence towards women and violence towards female animals. I mean, I think that's very clear, and that this is the way it's created. So we have to wake up again and realize that the dairy industry, if anyone's interested in liberation and equality, we can't be eating dairy products. This is the absolute antithesis of any kind of liberation for us as human beings in our relationships with each other. Okay. Um, going back to where we started a little bit, uh, I guess with this stuff going on in China, I mean, in the United States, um, how close are we to having a pandemic? Is it inevitable that one of these things could eventually happen in the United States? And again, is it realistic that our food choices could actually prevent this, or they don't? They, you know, are they or they wouldn't be enough of a factor to prevent this. Well, this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about: is predicting the next pandemic. And I've written articles for Slate and the New York Times, and in my book about how do we figure out what's coming for us and how do we protect ourselves. Um, one of the really interesting things is that if a virus or a pathogen is too deadly, it often wears itself out. So think about Ebola. It's one of those really scary things, but it kills people so quickly that it doesn't have a chance to spread beyond a few hundred or a few thousand people. What actually really worries us are viruses that will stay in you long enough for you to spread it to 100 people and then kill you. And so what we try to do is mapping out what kind of a pathogen, what kind of a superbug could actually do that. And the things that we have found is the most likely place that a pandemic is gonna come from, and a pandemic is different than an epidemic, pandemic meaning that it's everywhere. The ones that we're concerned about are called zoonoses, Z-O-O-N-O-S-E-S, -O -O -E meaning that they come, leap from animal to man. And then the question would be, well, where would this happen? And I've traveled all over the world looking for the places. And the group that I work with has identified that this often happens in places where animals are coming into contact with man in ways that they never have before. So things like deforestation or rapid population swelling, uh, places like Bangladesh or in China or in sub-Saharan Africa places where some child could wander into an area that has been uh, a deforested area, and there are now all of these animals without their natural habitat. And that's where bad things can happen. And then what we worry about is when somebody gets that infection, how is it gonna spread? And we get very worried when somebody with a deadly zoonotic infection gets on an airplane and that we can map the spread of all kinds of infections based on air travel. 
And that's one of the reasons, I'm on the ethics committee at my hospital and I think a lot about medical ethics and the ethics about uh, surrounding the idea that we're now quarantining 50 million people. Well, the reason that we're doing that in China is that we don't want people getting on airplanes. And that's a very tricky thing to, to address, but that's how infection spreads. And then one of the other ways that we're looking at how things like influenza spread are just by Google searches. We know that when people start searching things about fever, flu season has hit. And so we're using advanced metrics and uh, artificial intelligence, all kinds of technologies to try to stay one step ahead of these things. Um, I'm not somebody who goes around trying to spread doomsday scenarios about these things, um, but the truth is that when we have animal and man coming into contact in novel ways, in ways that we'd never seen before, and then people eating those foods that's, that are based off of those animals, um, that's when problems happen. Uh, and, and we're seeing that right now in the Wuhan province. Um, they're being very aggressive about the quarantining. Uh, the last I checked, we were close to 5,000 cases infected and more than, I think it was 107 people have died. Um, the question is, what is, have we seen anything like this before? And the comparison that people are making is to SARS. Uh, the, this is spreading more quickly. We don't know if it's going to cause more deaths, but they're being far more aggressive this time in quarantining people. The question becomes, if something like that came to the United States, we have a handful of cases here, but would we quarantine our own citizens? How would that look? What would that look like? When I go into meetings now uh, in my department and when I travel to meetings, the scientific meetings, this is the thing we're talking about, is would we quarantine Long Island? How would we do that? And what would that mean for people? And how do we justify that when we're trying to put uh, the public safety as number one? Um, just to follow up on that, you mentioned deforestation. Um, so what, how does our food choices affect, you said the deforestation allowed animals to come into contact with people. So how do our food choices have anything to do with deforestation? Mm. So the animal agricultural system places an enormous burden on the earth and on the land because we're wasting so many calories by cycling them through livestock. When cattle graze, they're eating grass, and it takes a lot of land to sustainably support one cow. So in that instance, it's a lot of land involved. When they're eating grain or soy, or other livestock are eating grain or soy, then they're wasting a lot of those calories by cycling them through livestock, and that takes a lot of land per pound of flesh. So it takes about 12 pounds of corn or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef. It takes about four or five per pound of pig, and maybe three or four per pound of chicken. It's like a protein factory in reverse. And uh, according to a study published in Science last year, which you actually read an article about this on stage, and I've been quoting it ever since. It was published in The Guardian, an article about this study. Um, the, uh, it was a study of um, researchers looked at um, uh, over 119,000 farms in 120 countries, and they looked at 40 different food crops that represent about 90% of the calories eaten by humans. And what they ultimately concluded was that livestock are responsible for about 83% of all agricultural land use on Earth. 83% for 17% of the world's calories and 37% of the world's protein. And if just theoretically the whole world went vegan tomorrow, the amount of land we would free up would be equal to the land mass of the United States, India, China, the European Union, and Australia combined. That's how much land would instantly be freed up. So that could go to forests, that could go to wildlife habitat, that could go to solar panels, that could go to really awesomely sustainable organic farms, that could go to all kinds of different things that would become available and accessible to us at that point. So by taking all of this land and putting it into the livestock system, one way or the other, whether we're directly putting animals there or we're producing food for animals there, we are putting a tax on our wildlife and ecosystems, which is fueling deforestation around the world. 
and desertification around the world. And then on top of that, because we're doing it so unsustainably and we're eroding our topsoil uh, and using up our water, we're creating kind of a collision course for even more competition with the remaining little bit of natural world in order to feed humanity, unless we change how we feed humanity. And so that's, uh, I'm really glad you emphasized the positivity of this because, uh, I mean, it sounds really negative in a sense that like we're wasting so much land and we're just, mm -hmm. just causing so much destruction and, of rainforest and so forth. But, you know, implicit in all of this is this enormously good news. It's not just twice as much land we'd say we're three times, we're talking about according to the National Academy of Sciences, 12 times as much land to feed someone eating uh, the standard Western diet as someone eating a plant-based diet. So uh, I think this is such a, a, a positive thing to, to really celebrate that we can, again, feed everyone on this planet a, a healthy plant-based diet on a fraction of the land and allow animals and, and ecosystems to, uh, to regenerate and our own health to regenerate and our society to come back into some kind of sanity again. Uh, and I think the question comes, I guess, really, is do we have time? Because my feeling is, traveling you know, ar around the world a lot lately, I'm giving lectures on this for the last maybe seven or eight years, um, seeing so many uh, vegan restaurants exploding. You know, it's just really great. We were, I mean, everywhere we go, we see this huge explosion uh, uh, and mushrooming of the vegan movement. It's going very, I love mushrooming because there's so many mushrooms in, in China when you're a vegan. <laughs> but anyway, you eat a lot of mushrooms. But the, uh, it's, it's, the whole thing is, is really growing so quickly. And I think personally, my feeling is, it's not scientific, but, I, but just in general, just seeing the way things are going, uh, the movement is, to me, so healthy and so uh, grassroots and decentralized uh, just in the last few years that it's, I think it's really unstoppable. I, at this point, there's just, just the, the internet and just the, meat, the, the number of veg fests is just, again, exploding everywhere. We were in Athens, for example. Just in three years, they had a veg fest that had 5,000 people, then the next year 10,000 people, then the next year 15,000 people. And we see this everywhere, you know, in Eastern Europe, and in, in Asia, in Australia, all over the world, South America. Veg fests are growing, animal sanctuaries, uh, meetup groups, all kinds of things. So uh, the question is, there's this like acceleration of awareness, of, of awakening, but there's also this acceleration of the destruction of ecosystems and whether we can pull it off in a sense, and whether we can save the world before we destroy ourselves and our sanity. And what, what is the, and I guess we don't know, but I think the most important thing from my point of view in all of this is to just give thanks that this earth is so beautiful and so abundant that we at least are, on, here, here we are, and there's, there's millions more people like us who are concerned and aware and are, are awakening that we can bind together with each other, we can encourage each other, and we can inspire and inform each other. We can find creative ways to work together. Each one of us has our unique perspective to bring to this. We each one of us has our own unique talents and abilities and skills uh, that we can bring to this and just find a way to plug in and share this message in, in a way that works for you uh, and to just take a moment every morning to give thanks that we have an opportunity to do that to help uh, bring about a positive transformation on this earth and to help liberate humanity and animals and, uh, and the whole web of life here because it is doable. I think we, we can see it. It's, there's nothing stopping us. It's just fear. The, the fear and the inertia going along, uh, but we have something more powerful than that. We have love and kindness and creativity and caring, and we have the truth, really, on our side. And uh, as Gandhi said, satyagraha, truth power, speaking our truth, and understanding the issues, and then bringing our lives into alignment, and doing the best we can to embody what veganism is. And what is veganism? Essentially, it's love, right? It's love that's not just abstract, it's practical. And like, what are you eating? <laughs> what are you buying? How are we living? It's very concrete action. And when we embody that and take time to deepen our connection with the roots of our true nature, so that it's coming from a deeper level than just the cultural program, but we're actually coming from our own uh, infinite in internal wisdom, then I think each one of us becomes a radiating center of power that cannot be stopped. Each one of us, everyone who awakens to this is an un unstoppable power. And when we can light each other's candle, it it's unstoppable. We're creating a movement that is absolutely unstoppable because it's not based 
on us marketing this. We're not trying to market. We're trying to embody. I said, I'm not even trying. We are embodying. This is our true nature. And uh, I just see it. I see it's, it really is an unstoppable movement. The question is, uh, can we uh, do it in time before everything collapses in a sense in some way? And I guess time will tell, but it's a really uh, an amazing time to be alive. And I'm grateful to all of you for uh, being born right now. Thank you. <laughs> hop on to that message of, of hope and optimism and the beautiful earth. Uh, because even though as we come from very different perspectives, uh, I just see so much overlap. And, and one of the things that comes up a lot for me is people sometimes ask me and they say, does it ever get you down, your job, just treating people with superbug infections? And the answer is no, uh, because the other part of my job, in addition to getting people better, is that I work with scientists who are constantly discovering new drugs to save people and to help people. And one of the messages I want to share with you today is where we're finding new antibiotics. And it turns out that the best place to look for new drugs is the soil beneath our feet. And what people may not appreciate, and which I didn't realize until I started doing research for my book, is that the soil is full of incredible diversity of life. And what's happening in the soil is that microbes, so fungi and bacteria and parasites, are constantly secreting chemicals, trying to engage in what we call subterranean warfare, where they're trying to win out by destroying what's around them. And if you can pluck out those chemicals that they're secreting, well, you've got antibiotics. That's what they're designed to do. They're ready-made. And the challenge we have is figuring out where to look and which drugs to invest in. Because what we're finding is that there was a, I talked about this this afternoon, that there was this study done where they asked people to send in soil from Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And what they brought in, the soil had dozens of drugs. But typically, it costs a billion dollars to take that discovery and to go through all of the testing necessary for FDA approval. And so what I spend a lot of time doing is working with scientists and with computer scientists um, using artificial intelligence to try to find that proverbial needle in a haystack, the next life-saving drug. But what's so exciting about this is that it's actually in the soil beneath our feet. And so when we talk about preserving life and we talk about you know, deforestation and embracing our ecology, uh, we do have a beautiful planet, and we're finding that yet another way that the planet is surprising us is that it is full of all kinds of life-saving drugs, and we just have to figure out where to look. Um, two more things that I'd like to ask about how our food choices have an impact. So I'm going to read you two different statements. One. Many of the water systems that keep ecosystems thriving and feeding a growing human population have become stressed. Rivers, lakes, and aquifers are drying up or becoming too polluted to use. More than half the world's wetlands have disappeared. Agriculture consumes more water than any other source and wastes much of that through inefficiencies. Climate change is altering patterns of weather and water around the world, causing shortages and droughts in some areas and floods in others. At the current consumption rate, this situation will only get worse. By 2025, two-thirds of the world's population may face water shortages, and ecosystems around the world will suffer even more. That's number one. Number two is, as global temperatures rise and the human population expands, more of the planet is vulnerable to desertification, the permanent degradation of land that was once arable. Further, while land degradation has occurred throughout history, the pace has accelerated, reaching 30 to 35 times the historical rate, according to the United Nations. More than 75% of the Earth's land area is already degraded, according to the European Commission's World Atlas of Desertification, and more than 90% could be degraded by 2050. So regarding water shortages and desertification, how does our food choices um, have an impact on this? Oh, there's some alarming statistics, and they're true. 
UN researchers are estimating that by the year 2050, we will have half the arable land per capita that we had in 1950 for human beings. And it's only going down. We also have reports that we have essentially 60 harvests left, 60 years left of farmable soil on this planet that at current rates of topsoil erosion will be at zero in 60 years. So when we ask what kind of world we're leaving for our children, we have to look at stuff like this, don't we? Because if you go from, you know, 10 feet of topsoil down to one foot, you can still grow food, but you go from one foot to zero and you cannot. And the other big thing it takes is water. And with more droughts and floods, it's less reliable to count on rainwater in many parts of the world, which makes us more dependent on our aquifers, which are terrifyingly being depleted. So billions of people depend on aquifers for their water, and we can't count on that because we're using them up. So what does this have to do with the food on our plates? Well, just about everything, actually, because desertification is being fueled by a combination of biodiversity exploitation, chopping down forests and so forth, and turning them into deserts, but, and changing climate patterns in a local level that way, but also most of all by our agricultural practices, which are so unsustainable. So moving towards more organic, more regenerative agricultural practices is absolutely critical. And by the way, could be part of the hope of the world because soil can actually sequester carbon it can capture carbon out of the atmosphere. You know, plants breathe in carbon dioxide, right? And when they die, it goes back out. But there are ways that they can capture it in their roots and the soil builds up. And we could actually do what nature has taken thousands of years to do to build up topsoil. We can do it much more quickly with the right agricultural practices, with composting and cover cropping and, and much more complex things than that that are available to us. And if we put a fraction of the focus on that that we've been putting on how to come up with new chemicals and new GMOs, we could help save the planet in short order. So I think regenerative agriculture is critically important. But the way we're going right now is the opposite of that. And uh, water, as, as I think you did mention, um, we're using up so much water for agriculture. There are varying statistics, but by some estimates, up to half of the water in the world is going to animal agriculture. It's going into irrigating cropland to feed to cattle and livestock. It's going to directly, obviously, being drunk by the animals. That's a little bit. It's going to irrigating pasture, even for pasture-raised meat. And it's also going into washing away their feces and then in turn being contaminated by their feces. So when you put all that together, when we move towards a more plant-based direction, we can save enormous amounts of water. By one estimate, it takes 2,000 gallons of water to produce one pound of feedlot beef in the United States today. And in the state of California, where I'm from, we, use, we export more water in the form of alfalfa for China to feed its livestock than the entire city of San Francisco uses. And in the state of California, which has a water issue, by the way, on an ongoing basis, we actually, um, more water is used for animal agriculture than is used for all municipal uses, plus all government uses, plus all business uses combined. All of our swimming pools and golf cars, courses and toilets and everything else in the state of California doesn't hold a candle compared to the amount of water we're using just for animal agriculture. And we import most of our meat in California. This is also an issue all over the world, of course. And so um, if we want to save water and if we want to save topsoil, then moving away from animal products is really one of the most important things we can do. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, the same, it's basically the same story in many ways that animal agriculture takes about 1,000 gallons of water to make one gallon of milk. And, and in California, it's about, I think it's about closer to 5,000 gallons of water for a pound of beef because of all the irrigation that's necessary. So um, we see this all around us in, in California, and we see it all over the world when we travel to China. It's interesting, in China, the government is actually mandating that people reduce the amount of meat they're eating by half, primarily because of water. Uh, issues in China and as well as climate concerns as well. 
Uh, and it's funny when I'm when I was in China and I and I say, gosh, you know, you have the the scientists are saying you should eat less meat, and uh, the government is saying that it's important to eat less meat. Uh, and um, the, uh, sometimes I say, gosh, I wish the U.S. government was as smart as your Chinese government was and would recommend the same thing. And everybody in China claps and they say, yeah, we wish, we wish so too. <laughs> I think it's important that, that the U.S. government was as wise as their government was in reducing, encouraging people to reduce the amount of meat they're eating. And uh, so, although it's interesting in China, they have this kind of interesting thing where, and we saw this also in Vietnam, uh, that in um, Japan, after the, with the introduction of dairy products, um, the Japanese people got quite a bit taller because of all the growth hormone in dairy products. And now the Chinese people don't like that. You know, they see all these tall Japanese. And so they want to be tall too. And so now I'm really not allowed. They don't like it. It's frowned upon for me when I go to China and give these lectures promoting veganism to talk about dairy because the government wants people to reduce meat, but they, they want to be tall. So they, they still want to have their dairy so they can be taller. But of course, that's contributing to so many other problems like diabetes and, and breast cancer and so forth. So hopefully they'll, they'll change their tune. But it's interesting how powerful the dairy industry is in lobbying governments, like in India, Vietnam, and China, that you have to you make sure your kids are getting dairy because otherwise they'll have calcium deficiency and they, uh, you know, and so forth. And it's ironic because uh, not only is, is dairy so environmentally devastating, like you're talking about huge amounts of, of water, huge amounts of, of methane and nitrous oxide and so forth given off by cows, uh, but it's just devastating to people's health. And uh, and yet these, the governments don't seem, they seem to be very open, unfortunately, to the dairy industry's propaganda all over the world. And uh, we see the uh, terrible health effects it's having you know, everywhere. But the, uh, the underlying idea, though, I think is that, uh, as we keep coming back to, that, that animal agriculture is so wasteful of water and of aquifers especially. I mean, these aquifers, like the Ogallala Aquifer, the aquifers in California, we have a huge problem in California with the land just suddenly sinking and breaking bridges and breaking roads and because they suck millions of gallons of water out and the land just collapses in these what are called sinkholes. Uh, and these, these aquifers took hundreds of thousands of years in many cases to, uh, to charge up and we're depleting them in a matter of a few years, so there's nothing left. Uh, it's really tragic when we're, you know, like I say, in our RV, you know, traveling all over the, the Pacific, the, um, the Southwest, for example, in, in uh, the Pacific region and seeing the Colorado River, our taxpayer money is paying for these extremely expensive irrigation projects. It's taxpayer funded, you know, we pay for it with these incredibly expensive, huge pumps that pump all this water, and we pay for all the maintenance of all these irrigation canals, and they're just used by the meat and dairy industries, to, and the Colorado River never even reaches the, uh, the Sea of Cortez anymore. It's just siphoned off into uh, these huge feedlots for cows, massive feedlots where these cows are eating huge, enormous quantities of grain, making gigantic piles of sewage that they don't know what to do with. It stinks, it destroys, destroys everything, causing E. coli for all the farmers that are trying to grow uh, lettuce and so forth in the area. And uh, somehow this is just encouraged. It's allowed to happen. These, these, they're all subsidized, actually. Everything is subsidized. There's, the water is subsidized. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, allotments that are given to these uh, farmers. Uh, to re to, it's a very unfair system. And I think it's really important to understand the, the enormous power that the uh, animal agriculture system has had from the very beginning. You know, and like in the world piece that I talk about, how 10,000 years ago in Iraq, uh, for the very first time because of animal agriculture, there arose this wealthy elite class that dominated uh, the entire world. That was the kings, uh, and today it's the ranchers. They, they ran the kings were ranchers. That's why they were powerful and wealthy. So here in the, in the, in the New World, when they, when they came over here from Europe, they brought their, their system of animals. The, the Indians called it the slave animals. Uh, and they looked at the Europeans like, you know, what the heck are you doing with these slave animals? Uh, but the slave animal system w was immediately uh, destroying the ecosystem here and killing all the buffalo and just, but it was the, it was the land grants to the Spanish and, and so forth 
that gave people all this land to have their cows. And uh, from the very beginning, they controlled the government. I mean, t completely controlled. So it's, if you try to have like human sewage, which is uh, controlled very stringently because it could pollute the water, right? So we have all kinds of rules about human sewage because we don't want to pollute our water resource. Animal agriculture is, is, is thousands of times more water that they use and they pollute it more severely. And there's no regulations, basically. They, they, you know, they can have these huge lagoons of manure that are breaking and polluting the water all over the country, in North Carolina, all over the country. We see it happening when we travel. Uh, there's no regulations. There's no rules about, about the water in animal agriculture. Why? Because they don't want rules. They don't want any rules, so there's no rules. They can do whatever they want. They can, they can, pour, they can take their feces from their gigantic uh, animal agriculture operations and just spray it on the fields. And it just runs right into the rivers and causes uh, the inc incredible disease outbreaks of these, uh, this organism. It's called the uh, fish from hell, fiscusquita, something like that. It causes people's, uh, it's some kind of a thing. It, it, it's a big problem in Virginia sometimes. They have these... Uh, but, but all these bizarre diseases that come from this stuff. So the whole thing is to realize that this is all subsidized. It's all uh, uh, paid for by us as taxpayers. Um, these ranchers and farmers really uh, are given enormous tax breaks and so forth in order to continually pollute and destroy ecosystems. And how is it possible? I mean, how do we respond to this? I think that's really the question for us, all of us. As, as citizens, is how do we respond to a situation where there is this historical domination of the will of the people by a tiny elite that is ruining the planet and our chances of survival and is being funded by our, ta by our funds uh, in, in the process. And it costs so much money for people to try to get something organically certified that, it, that we have to pay more for organic because you have to pay to have it certified. And, the, and then the non-organics get subsidized on a massive level. So everybody's eating these foods. And it just increases, obviously, the profits for the pharmaceutical, what I call the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media, banking complex, right? We have this complex that gets very wealthy on this. But it's really, it's so past time for us uh, to understand, to make an effort to understand this and articulate this and spread this message so that uh, we make changes not only in our grassroots personal lives, but on government policy level as well. The government, uh, our governments, uh, the local level, state level, federal level, all really need uh, to hear from us, I think. Uh, and that's why it's so important, I think, to have this kind of educational forum where we share these ideas and get it out as much as we can so that we can take action on every level. So those of us who are really interested in political activism can work on that level. Those of us who are concerned more with, with helping people with their health or whatever it is, but we all have a part to play. And uh, I think that the injustice that's happening is so over the top here. Uh, the, the, uh, the corruption is so egregious that it, it, it's really almost comical to, if it wasn't so horrible. So it's really, again, past time for us to understand this and to make our voices heard as best we can, however we can do that in a respectful way. Thank you. Yeah, I think adding on to that, what I'm gonna take away from this conference are, are three things. One is I'm gonna make better food choices. I'm trying. <laughs> Number two is to become more engaged in the process, in the political process. We've talked about how there's often a lobbying group behind something when you say, why, why would it be like that? Or who's, who's allowing this to happen? And I wouldn't want to become more involved in that. And then the third thing is just sharing what I've learned here with other people. I hope that you take away from this that, you know, there are people out there in your lives, I know there are people in my lives who want to hear about this. Uh, every night, my wife and I are trying to figure out what do we put in front of our children to feed them? Uh, what do we say to my father-in-law and my mother-in-law who may be stick in the muds about, you know, change? And is there a way that we can meet people halfway or that we can meet people where they're at and, and change their lives as well? Um, I have this a lot in, in my clinic or when I see patients who I'm trying to convince them of stuff. And I think about how would I reach this person? What can I say to them? And I'm going to start thinking about that when it comes to food choices. Uh, and I hope you will too.
So someone goes home tonight, and their spouse is half asleep, and they say, how was the panel? And they go, it was great. And they say, what did they say? And they got two minutes to tell them, you know, the specific action steps. So I guess what is the bottom, bottom line? What are the three to five, what are the very specific things you are saying to do to best deal with all of these issues? What are, what are the most specific tangible action steps? Should we take vitamin B12? Should we, you know, what should we exactly do to have the most impact on all these issues? Um, well, honey, <laughs> they, there were these crazy people on stage tonight, and um, they convinced me that um, we can heal the world and our health and, and prevent and, and reverse climate change and save our soils and feed the world um, and, and create a more peaceful and beautiful society by eating less or no meat and by eating whole plant foods and by changing what we feed our kids and changing what's taught in medical school and getting antibiotics out of factory farms and changing government subsidies so we stop subsidizing junk food and commodities crops and, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and we can do all that tomorrow, sweetheart. <laughs> and I'm being slightly facetious when I say tomorrow, but I will actually be honest that we kind of could. Because literally, all of that could happen very, very quickly. Human beings are remarkably resourceful creatures when we need to be. And I think this is the time when we need to be because the stakes are enormous and the cost of continuing on the status quo is devastating. But we have the capacity individually and collectively to create radical change. And you do not have to wait for a government food policy or the current administration in Washington, nor for food companies or any other entity to change what you eat and what you feed your family. And then we can also organize, because I do believe that if the people lead, the leaders will follow. We can organize individually and collectively, and we create a new food economy that's based on life instead of death, that's based on healing instead of destruction. And in that process, we change the world. I just um, am so uh, honored to be here, and I'm, I'm so in love with uh, these two beautiful men to each side of me here. <laughs> I'm really, uh, I'm so, I'm really impressed. Yeah, I'm really very, uh, <laughs> I, I know, I, I, it's so, yeah, and Steve, right? <laughs> and, uh, no, really to see um, the, uh, the, the fact that, you know, all, I mean, really, the, the um, the programming is so deep, it gets into us. Think about it. I mean, we're born, as soon as we're born, we come to, before we're born, we're in the womb, right? We're in the womb, and for most cases, like in my case, my mother was eating meat, dairy products, and eggs. I was, eat, you know, I was, I was coming into me already. As soon as I'm born, uh, a lot of kids don't even get their mother's breast anymore. I was lucky to get that, but the, um, but the baby foods are, are, are chicken and veal and turkey and cheese, you know, feeding death to, the, to little kids. We're getting this food. Uh, it becomes the very cells of our being from the time we're little infants. It's the way we bond with everyone around us at school, at church, you know, wherever it is. We're, we're, you know, the doctor's telling us we better make sure we get plenty of meat. The dentist is saying we make sure we eat plenty of, uh, of dairy products and, and so forth. And so we're, we're, we're raised in a society uh, where it's well understood that, that food is the most powerful uh, way that we bond and it's the most powerful way that our society transmits values. And these are all go in at a very deep level uh, from infancy. So the fact that we're able to come together and actually articulate these ideas and, and just say, n you know, no way, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm rejecting that whole uh, way of eating and the, and the cultural story and the cultural narrative, it's really a tribal identity. You know, because think about it, I mean, it's, people have been living tribally, and if I was to say to the rest of the tribe, 
hey, you know, I'm not going to eat your food anymore. That was, that's unthinkable. That's completely impossible. Yeah, that would, the, the tribe would say, okay, go off and die by yourself. In the, in, you know, we, that's it. You know, so for us as vegans, we say, we're saying, basically saying to the tribe, we're, I'm not eating your food anymore. And that's one of the reasons I think that people find vegans so upsetting because we're, we're challenging this unspoken, you just don't do that. You don't question the tribe's food. And so I think that's one of the reasons when we do make the shift to veganism uh, or to whatever you want to call it, eating a, a plant-based diet for ethical reasons and for, for, for the greater good uh, and for, for nonviolence and for liberation, um, we feel a, a deep obligation, I think, naturally, because we realize that this, we're in a really serious situation here. And in many ways, we're the only ones that have any power. Because, you know, like for example, if there's a crime being committed publicly, right, there's three roles that are being enacted. Okay, so there's someone being mugged, right, a victim. There's someone else, a perpetrator, attacking them. But then since it's a public crime, there's an observer. There's a, a witness, a bystander who's seeing this. So the victim is hoping that this bystander will speak up. You know, say something, stop. I'm gonna call the police, Go, jump in, help them. The perpetrator is hoping that this bystander just looks the other way, doesn't say anything, kind of walks away, just mind your own business, don't say anything. And the bystander has the choice to make in this situation. And so the, the, the world we're born into, it, it's a, in many ways it's pretty bleak in the sense that we have billions of victims, these animals who are being horribly abused, hyper-confined, mutilated, castrated, babies stolen, in horrible uh, violence. We also have literally billions of perpetrators, the people who are taking out their wallets. I mean, the perpetrator is someone, uh, quite honestly, when I pay for this, that's where it happens. I pay, as soon as I pay for meat, dairy, product stories, I'm paying someone to stab uh, someone. So, so that's, um, so we have billions of perpetrators, but the perpetrators themselves are victims. The only reason they're doing it is because they've been abused as children and being forced into this behavior. It's not, it's not a free choice. We're just following orders that are harmful to our health. Uh, we're being exploited. Anyone who's eating animal foods is being exploited. They're the ones that are going to end up getting, getting a heart bypass or getting diabetes and so forth, typically. So we have the situation as kind of a, a death spiral. The, the perpetrators can't get out of it. The victims can't escape. They're just killing and killing and eating and destroying. And it's only the, the bystanders. There's only a few vegans out here kind of watching this whole thing. And of course, the natural response for the people who are the perpetrators is just look the other way. Don't say anything. Just don't, don't just shut up. And you never notice how people always say, there's that joke, like, how do you know if someone's a vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the joke. <laughs> but that, you know, people, people don't like it that, we, that vegans are too uppity, right? We're, we're talking too much and we're kind of you know, making, you know, challenging them or making them uncomfortable and so forth. But really, that's our job. I mean, we're, we should be making people uncomfortable you know, in a loving way. I mean, in somewhat respect, not, not just shaming and criticizing and blaming and you know, that kind of thing, but, but helping people to be creatively uncomfortable, essentially, because this, this, the perpetrator and the victim in this situation are, are, are if this continues on, we're, it's over. And so we're, those of us who have managed somehow to escape from this prison uh, are so blessed. We should, I mean, really, I wake up every morning, I just give thanks. I always say the smartest thing I ever did 40 years ago, besides marrying Madeline like 25 years ago, but 40 years ago I went vegan. And I, it was the smartest thing I ever did um, because it creates the foundation for, for liberation, for freedom, for joy, for abundance, for gratitude, and for radiant health. It's really a foundation that's solid. Uh, for beauty and uh, creativity and joy. And so uh, when we, if we've discovered this, if we've been able to, then I think it's really incumbent upon us to deepen that in ourselves so that we're not dragged down to the same level. And I think the problem is a lot of us, when we go, become vegans or we, we, we make an effort to understand these things, we can immerse ourselves in the violence and the misery and the bad news. Right? Who's watching the YouTube videos of undercover footage of factory farms and slaughterhouses? 
It's only vegans. Right? We're the only ones watching that stuff. The, the meat eaters, they're not going to watch that. They, I want to enjoy my bacon. I'm not going to, you can look at that if you want. I'm going to enjoy my bacon. I'm not going to look at that stuff. So, the, the, so they're not watching it. So we're watching all this. We're thinking, oh, and I've seen this happen over and over again. I, you know, someone comes up to, to someone and says, so I hear you're a vegan. And the person says, yeah, I'm a vegan. I'm telling you, you know, there's so much suffering in the world. I mean, the animals are getting abused. The people don't care. They go to Kentucky Fried Killing and Junk in the Box and Murder King. There's just violence everywhere. It's really, it's just, you know, once you understand this, it's really, it's so hard. And the person goes, wow, you're a vegan. Man, I sure am glad I'm not a vegan. Man, that's really... That sounds really heavy. You know, so it, that happens a lot. We get, we get so taken down and we get so angry and frustrated. We want to shake everybody till they go vegan. We want to you know, tell them, we want to criticize them, we want to shame them into it. And of course, people, they say that, you know, they, we can't change people that way. How many people can we actually change, do you think? <laughs> All right, that's the question. How many can we really change? See, the thing is, I think we can ultimately only change ourselves. I mean, in terms of changing someone. Because if, I, if someone came up to me and was trying to change me, what would I do? I would, I would fight back. <laughs> it's a natural response, healthy response to kind of, you know, to, to protect ourselves if someone's trying to change us. So, but we can plant seeds of transformation in everyone. And I think this is really the key. There's a great uh, poem by Walt Whitman. He wrote a poem called Song of Myself. And in that poem, there's a, lot, there's a line that I really love. He said... Uh, I and mine, we do not convince by arguments. We convince by our presence. And I think this is the, this is the frontier for us uh, as, as advocates for, uh, for the real truth about health. It's to make an effort to embody what we're talking about, to embody kindness and respect and awareness, to embody an understanding of the big picture of our society, the woundedness that we've all endured, the interconnectedness of justice issues and health issues and environmental issues, all the, you know, understand how this all fits together and have compassion and respect for people who are wounded and are sick and are harming animals. If someone is wounded, you don't kick them and spit on them. You try to be loving. You know, love and is the healing power and veganism is love. That's really what it is. And so I think the more that we embody what veganism is as love, then we begin to be a force for transformation without trying to change people. The irony is, if I go around trying to change everybody, who, how many people change? Nobody. They all resist and they fight back. If I really transform myself so that I'm embodying what veganism is as kindness and respect for not only uh, non-human animals, but for human animals, then everybody changes. Literally. I mean, people will change just by being in our presence. It happens. This is the, this is the, this is the uh, frontier for our movement. I really feel this. As we create a movement where instead of trying to change everybody else, we're working on ourselves to embody this and then articulate it from our hearts as love and awareness, we create a movement that's absolutely unstoppable. And it's happening. We see it happening. People are really waking up and realizing this is not a movement where we're just going to beat them down and win. This is a movement where we all change together. We awaken and we help each other to awaken. It's a movement of love and kindness and respect for all life. And it is unstoppable because it's based on the truth of our interconnectedness and the truth of our connectedness with, with the infinite awareness that is our true nature. And so to cultivate that, to plant those seeds and water those seeds in other people and see that everyone that we see is a, is a potential vegan advocate. And really, we, everyone is. There's no one who's unreachable, I don't think. Uh, and to see the best in other people whenever we address them and address that, address that in them. And I think when we do this, we, we are creating a movement that's unstoppable. So thank you all so much for the efforts you're making. Thank you. I'll end with a, a short final thought, which is that uh, my book came out a few months ago, and I was at a book fair, and I was standing in front of it. And there were a number of other authors with their books. And it was a mix of fiction and nonfiction, of history, mystery, all kinds of stuff. And I noticed that there was a subset of people, maybe a third of the people who came by when they would be looking at the novels and looking at whatever they were looking at. They had a nice smile on their face, and then they'd get to my book and they'd go, oh. Not everyone, um, but there were some. And I say, well, what's up? <laughs> and the, the, the thing was, they basically said, I got enough to worry about. I don't need another thing to drag me down. And I said, well, this isn't a downer of a story. 
I said, I wouldn't write a book if we were failing in this, you know, about people dying. You know, this is a beautiful story, and it's one of humans helping humans. It's people looking to our earth for resources to help heal people. And that this is a story that's ultimately uplifting and one that fills me with hope that every day there are people coming together to try to help strangers who have these infections. And just being up here on this panel, hearing about the things I've learned just from tonight about uh, humans helping humans, you know, sharing knowledge. Uh, I think it's a really beautiful thing. And I can tell you, you all pay far more attention to the stuff that I say than the medical students do. <laughs> the lecture hall, is, uh, so, so thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. It's been a wonderful panel.